Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so pleased to have you with me today uh, on my programs in church history. And uh, I uh, am uh, working uh, and getting the English version of my first published book uh, uh, published. And they, they think that it will be released sometime probably in September around 2018. And uh, the title of the book, as I have spoken in previous programs that uh, in my lessons in church history, that are archived on YouTube. Uh, if you just go to the YouTube homepage and put in the search box, Richard Allinger you, presents, you, you can see some of the previous uh, programs in church history. And there I told you the title of my book was uh, The Reformation Cannot Be Over. And uh, uh, it's, it's seven chapters, and I would say uh, it, it's the content of the book with its charts, its maps, its pictures, and uh, the content of seven chapters, uh, I think that a probably a middle school uh, student could probably read and understand pretty clearly uh, what the content uh, of the book concludes that the Reformation cannot be over. So it's not really a difficult read. And with its uh, charts and maps and pictures and credits and photos, uh, it, it could be uh, an enjoyable book to pick up and read, maybe 125 pages. And it, it will be a tool in the hands of Sunday school teachers and other uh, people that are involved in Christian education to kind of connect all the dots around uh, what the Reformation uh, was all about. This started f about 500 years ago. And the first chapter of the book is uh, pages 2 through 17, and it's, it's from the ancient church uh, of Christ and his first century apostles to the modern church uh, of our day, the emerging modern church of our day, and all that it is. And, uh, and then the second chapter, pages 24 through 29, is the doctrine of justification by faith alone in, in, in Christ's sacrifice on Golgotha's cross, instituting the new covenant and the new testament, which was in his shed blood. Uh, and then chapter 3 would be pages 24 through 29. What has caused some to think that the Reformation is over? See, in the last 500 years, there's been things happening uh, that has caused some to think that possibly the Reformation could be over. And then chapter 4, verses 29 through 38, is uh, the remaining areas of agreement and disagreement after the 500-year historic standoff between the Roman Catholic Church and the, the, pro, the protesters. And you know, the protesters, by and large, uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, as early on as the second century uh, of the church, you know, after Christ had ascended and his 12 chosen apostles had all been martyred, or John the Elder uh, dying, they think, somewhere around Edessa along the Euphrates River. And having been given the book of Revelation uh, around, around this time, uh, shortly on toward the end of the second century of the church history, uh, and uh, up into the third and fourth centuries, uh, what began to manifest or surface amongst the followers of Christ was uh, different interpretations of doctrine to a point that by the time it got up to the 8th century, uh, it was very troublesome to many people in the church that, hey, the church is kind of, you know, getting off track. Now, uh, now, mind you, there's always been individual, uh, you know, believers in Christ and followers that may not have been part 
of the different organizational or institutional churches that begin to happen uh, as early as like the Roman Catholic Church in the fifth century. There was just a lot of people that uh, uh, had their beliefs in Christ and read their Bibles and prayed and weren't part of any kind of organization or association of believers. They've always been here too since Christ died on the cross and established his church. Uh, but again, it became troublesome to people, especially in the organized churches of the 8th century, the 9th century, the 10th century, the 11th century. The These were the, the pre-Reformation uh, reformers. And they mostly were Roman Catholic priests themselves, and they had, didn't want anything to happen to the, they didn't want to uh, get rid of the Roman Catholic Church, the, their church, but they wanted it to kind of get back on track to what it was in the first century with Christ and his apostles. And so the, the, the European early descent, there was early African descent uh, amongst some of the bishops and, uh, uh, you know, leaders of the Christian gatherings as early as really as early as like I said the end of the second century but then it began to really uh, coalesce and become a concern uh, that uh, there would probably also uh, the divisions became and the schisms became so uh, um, uh, manifested that like in the North African Don Donatus controversy and in the uh, uh, Europe, early European descent in the 8th century uh, and, and this is before Martin Luther, there was a lot of martyrdom on the part of these reformers because the established uh, uh, religions and their organizations and their heads and their doctrine did not want to change and be told that possibly they're getting away from really the scripture uh, and what it, it, it says that the church should be. So uh, with that, before you know Martin Luther and the 16th century protests, uh, there was early on dissent, really, about the way the church was going as far as the end of the second century. But it took uh, other subsequent centuries for it to actually become a movement. Like the 16th century and the Protestant Reformation was a movement that changed the whole world. That's where the rise of the middle class came in. Uh, uh, that's where compulsory public education came in and all the other subsequent Protestant denominations. It's, it's really uh, shaped very much our Western civilization and its culture. So again, the fourth chapter of the book is the remaining areas of agreement and disagreement after 500 years of a historic standoff between 1517 AD when Dr. Martin Luther pinned his or nailed his 95 indictments against the Roman Catholic Church on the University of Wittenberg door uh, in October 31st, 1517 AD up to 2017 AD last year, October was the 500th anniversary celebration of this historic uh, uh, moment. And then the fifth chapter of the book is the theological differences, uh, pages 38 through 44. Pages 38 through 44, chapter 5, is the theological differences which have never been resolved and why the Reformation cannot be over. And again, that's the title of the book, The Reformation Cannot Be Over. And then the sixth chapter and the seventh chapter, the sixth chapter concludes with uh, Martin Luther's, Dr. Martin Luther's 95 Thesis or Indictments Against the Roman Catholic Church, pages 44 through 52. And chapter 7 was here right in Flint, Michigan, back in uh, January 3rd, 1974, uh, a uh, Pentecostal Nazarene uh, minister uh, here locally in Flint, Michigan, uh, posted his 95 thesis or indictments against the Church of the Nazarene, and that would be pages 52 
through 73. And as I told you, Dr. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic priest uh, in that organization uh, before he posted his indictments. And the Reverend Bernard Gill was a respected minister in the Nazarene Church here in Flint, Michigan. He pastored uh, the West Flint Church of the Nazarene for several years, and he was the pastor of South Flint Church of the Nazarene for several years. Uh, and he was a highly respected Nazarene minister. Uh, but uh, because the Spirit moved him, that's why the name of his church at his last, went before he died at 50 years old here in Flint, uh, shortly after he posted the in 95 indictments against the Church of the Nazarene, he, he wanted his his church over on 925 West Atherton Road to be called the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene because, as he said in his indictments, the organized Nazarene denomination dropped their name, founding name, Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene uh, between World War One and World War Two because they didn't really want people that had the gifts of the Spirit to operate in their midst. They had their own program and agenda, so they dropped the name Pentecostal. And that's, that all is discussed in previous uh, programs that I told you are archived on YouTube if you're interested in seeing what they were. Uh, now, uh, chapter one, uh, from the ancient church to our present modern emerging church, the modern emerging church of our day. Chapter 1 begins with um, immediately after uh, Christ uh, commissioned his followers to proclaim his teachings, propagating the glorious news of his resurrection from the dead and his majestic ascension into heaven, Satan, working through the corrupt religious system of Judaism, and heathen world government of the Roman emperor uh, attempted to stamp out the name of Jesus and murder all of his followers. With such, with, with such action, Christ's enemies would wipe, uh, wipe out his person, his work, his theology, his teachings, and lastly, his followers, causing all that Jesus began to say and to do to be forever forgotten. However, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, would not allow the Lord's enemies' uh, persecutions to stop the growth and expansion of his church. In the Bible, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And that is out of the Holy uh, Bible, King James Version, Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. Apostle Paul of the first century church wrote in the New Testament uh, in um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Verse 1 reads, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all has one 
untimely born, he appeared to me also. Um, during the first five centuries of the establishment and growth of Christ's church, the Roman emperor Constantine declared that Christianity would be the official religion of the Roman Empire in 313 A.D. With a gradual subtly, subtlety following this decree, a great spiritual darkness eclipsed the glorious light of the pure gospel delivered to mankind by Jesus and his first century followers. For 1,000 years, uh, uh, 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D., the word of God had been largely, by and large, locked up in the Roman Catholic Church, chained to their pulpit in the original biblical languages of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin that the common people did not know or understand. This, in addition to the corruption and apostasy that had settled into not just the West Roman Catholic Church, but also into the East Byzantine Orthodox Church, brought about great discontent of many in the church as early as the 13th, well, as I told you at the introduction of this program, as early as really the uh, end of the second century, uh, there was discontent the way the church was getting off track away from the scriptures as early as the second century and more so in the eighth up to the 11th century. And by the 13th and 14th centuries, oh my word, uh, it resulted in the ripening of time ushering in the 16th century reformation to fulfill their historical responsibility, and that was the protest that changed the whole world. Subsequently, October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther, a Roman Catholic priest, nailed his 95 thesis or indictments to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. Wittenberg, or Wittenberg, they say it's Wittenberg, Germany. He did so for the sake of uh, the peace and purity and unity of the church. Immediately following this event in ecclesiastical and theological history, and because of the work of other reformers, the Protestant Reformation was well underway. With the establishment of Protestant denominations, uh, over the last five centuries of time, that has lapsed, the question of, is the Reformation over, is now, being asked by many believers in the postmodern, post-Christian cultures of our day. Since Vatican II, or the Ecumenical Council of 1962 to 1965, many of the West Roman Catholic Church and the East uh, Orthodox Churches are in agreement with the growing number of Protestant evangelicals thinking that the Reformation of the 16th century being over have joined together in an ongoing ecumenical movement. Many within this movement believe it is to be the solution of the problematic moral debates and social problems that are emerging in our postmodern and post-Christian uh, world of the 21st century, that is, cultures that are in a dangerous secular drift away from biblical principles. It is my purpose to prove that the Reformation cannot be over and that it is our responsibility in this generation and in all other generations that make up the body of Christ to always be reforming in the Latin word semper reformanda, which means always reforming, uh, always moving closer to the pure gospel and what the Lord intended his church to be until Christ returns. Uh, Brad, Gregory, Brad Gregory wrote masterfully in his book, The Unintended Reformation, helping us of the 21st century to uh, conceptualize exactly 
where the 16th century Reformation was with respect to our time. He wrote, The place of the Reformation in European history seems clear. It falls between the Middle Ages and modernity. Has something long gone, over, and done with. It seems distant from the political realities and global capitalism of the early 21st century, far removed from present-day moral debates and social problems. What transpired five centuries ago continues today to profoundly influence the lives of everyone, not only in uh, Africa and Europe and North America, but all around the world, even in China and India, where and in the global south of South America and Latin America, where the largest uh, revivals are taking place right now. In the global south, that would be Africa and South America. At this very hour, the movement of the Holy Spirit and millions of people are getting saved, outpacing the spread of Islam. More people are converting to Christ. And that all has to do with uh, the transfer of technology, getting the Word of God translated into other people's vernacular of the global south, which they really didn't have until here recently with uh, the technology transfer of biblical propagation and translation into their own languages, and millions are getting saved in the global south. Uh, so uh, that is kind of reshaping the whole landscape of modern-day emerging uh Christian church right now, which is outpacing the spread of Islam. And the Holy Spirit seems to be moving on Islamic nations, and many of, we see a great uh, conversion of people that were Muslims coming, uh, converting over to Christianity now in a bigger way, and probably will be so the more as we get closer to the second return of Christ, because uh, he's promised to pour out of his spirit, in in greater measure, the more, even up until he returns. Uh, It's really uh, unfathomable, and it's a kind of unspeakable. We'll just have to let that unfold as we live out our days and uh, fulfill our responsibilities to Christ in this generation, and then that will be in the uh, the next generation to witness and, and be a part of and see. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So with Brad Gregory's uh, 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 observation of where we are with regard to this uh, Reformation helps us better kind of understand uh, uh, and conceptualize what happened 500 years ago with respect to where we're at today and all of the demographics today of, of our our culture. Uh, and our, I'll tell you, the whole landscape of the world is changing because of technology and Bible translations and so on. Uh, and uh, William Faulkner famously said, the past is never dead. It is not even past. He spoke more truly than he perhaps knew yet in ways I doubt that he suspected. Nevertheless, the ideological and institutional shifts that occurred five or more centuries ago remain substantively uh, necessary to an explanation of why the Western world today is as it is. Paradoxically, the enormity of the transition from pre-modern to modern is precisely what has helped to mask the continuing influence of the distant past in the present. In a similar view, Ellen uh, Santilli Vaughan, in her book, The Body Being Light in Darkness, eloquently wrote, The Reformation of the 16th century came at the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of modern times. The Reformation was a revival of the pure gospel, all of the following factors has forever changed the landscape of Western Christianity. The two burning questions of the Reformation were, 
What must I do to be saved? And where can I find the true church? Just as the early church wrestled with the question of the Trinity and Christology, so the reformers of the 16th century struggled to understand salvation and its meaning for the Christian life and salvation with regard to sanctification and what that meant. And that was to all be worked out in time too. Uh, movements, the Christian movement requires, as you can see, it's centuries of time. Uh, and he's been building his church for, yes, Jesus has been really building his church for a mighty long time. Well, friends, uh, I'm going to close this particular segment now of Richard Allinger Presents Lessons in Church History and invite you back to my next session where I can bring this chapter to its end. You know, not all the fathers have their sons nearby. Some live out of state, out of town, 
or just can't make it in, you come on out and join us in the park. University Square, University Avenue, and Grand Traverse from 3.30 to 9.30 on June 18th. We're going to have a Father's Day, Juneteenth cookout. Come on and get some food, enjoy some games, all for you on Father's Day, June 18th from 3 to 9.30 right here in University Square, Grand Traverse and University Avenue from 3.30 to 9.30. There's going to be entertainment, there's going to be food, there's going to be fun. Come on out, join the Villas, let us celebrate you. Brought to you in part by WFOV, Flintbeat.com, Fly City, Spectacle Productions, and the Greater Flint Arts Council. Bye, Janet. It's nice seeing you see again. You, you a good girl. Just let me know what I can do to help. Well, to help me, she'd have to help every day. Every hour, every ouch, every time my wife calls for help. I mean, maybe she could help me make her lunch. But the crust, all the crust has to be cut off the corners. She could help me run to the doctor for the fifth time this week. Help me with the specialist and the second opinions and the painful paperwork about paperwork. Help me deal with how hard it is seeing my wife's name on so much paperwork. But this is on me. I'm the only one who can do this, like this, for her. Besides... Take care. We will. <laughs> Janet doesn't like her cooking anyway. Find support for your strength. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. What to expect when you're expecting a teenager. Today we're talking about how to wake up your teen, and this works literally every time. Good kisses. Good kisses. You heard how loud I, I heard. I heard. It wasn't you. It was the. Is that bacon? You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? <laughs> B, console her. Don't worry, sweetie. This is gonna happen a lot. Or C, find her a new boyfriend. Nice single boys. <laughs> that was weird. As a parent, there are no perfect answers, but you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so pleased to have you as my guest uh, of this program in church history. I'm Richard Allinger, your host. And at the same time, every Friday afternoon, you can uh, listen to me on uh, 92.1 on the FM dial and uh, Channel 17 on Comcast Cable. Hey, Richard, we, we may be moving you to Sunday. Oh, really? Well, yeah. I'm, I, I'm in your hands. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, I'm in your hands, whatever you want to do. Yeah, now, is this going to be on the program, too? That'll be okay? Yeah, that'll be okay, yeah. I'm so uh, pleased with my... Uh, a producer that produces and edits these programs for me to put in television and radio format on 92.1 on the FM dial and here on Comcast Cable, Channel 17, Flint Area uh, Community Television. And uh, I'm just so pleased to have you with me. And uh, it, it, the programming uh, uh, manager said that uh, he might be putting my uh, programs in church history uh, instead of on Friday afternoon, he said that they might be programming it in on Sunday. Well, uh, that would that would really be nice too on the Lord's Day to actually have a program about uh, the history of Christ and Him building His church. He's been building His church now. For, he's been faithful to His word all over the world on all seven continents. He's, and I'm going to help you appreciate church history more because most of us only know about 25% of our church history. But the whole 100% of church history is for what we've inherited as adopted children of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And I want to help you and I both come to appreciate 
uh, the history of the church and what Christ has been doing for the last 2,000 years in a more enhanced manner. And in that regard, in church history, as you know, a historic movement in church history happened uh, in, in the second thousand years of the church in 1500, the 16th century, the uh, Protestant Reformation. And picking up there, uh, what I wanted to talk about, uh, because that was called the Middle Ages, uh, this will be in chapter one of my book that will be released in September of 2018. The title of the book is uh, going to be The Reformation Cannot Be Over. And it will be encrypted on the internet also, uh, with Amazon.com, so people on all over the World Wide Web, three, approaching three billion, if not more people than that, who have access to the internet, can actually uh, get a hold of this book because it's just 125 pages, seven chapters, full of uh, uh, maps, uh, graphs, uh, pictures, and charts uh, that will be a tool in the hand of Christian educators and Sunday school teachers. Uh, and uh, I was just sharing with you a little bit of the content in chapter one in this program here. And it, uh, continuing, it says that as the Middle Ages drew to a close, many advocates of reform were convinced that the greatest ill of the church was obscuritism of what soon would be called the Dark Ages. The printing press, the influx of the Byzantine scholars, and the rediscovery of the artistic and literary leg legacies of antiquity gave credence to the hope that the furtherance of scholarship and education would produce the much-needed reformation of the church. Uh, if at some point in the past, centuries, uh, in the past centuries, at some point, Practices had been introduced that were contrary to original Christian teaching. And it seemed reasonable to surmise that a return to the sources of Christianity uh, of both biblical and patrist patristic uh, would do away with such practices. In other words, reforming how the church might have got off track through the centuries back to what it was in the first century with Christ and his apostles when he was walking among men before his ascension. Uh, as it became clear that the church in the 16th century was urgently in need of reform, uh, so also the church in our day necessitates reform. Only the word and spirit of God will ultimately reform the church. Uh, men, we really, in our own humanity, can do nothing because the Master said that. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. Uh, that Therefore, we have to understand that if there is going to be a, a, a movement, it will only be because of the Word and the Spirit of God will ultimately uh, become a movement to actually reform his church, uh, a continuing reformation, if you will, uh, that was started 500 years ago. We all should pray and work faithfully to such reform, that such reform come in our time. And as you know, the, the Protestant movement and those involved in that, they, they preach it, they teach it, and they uh, publish it on, you know, DVD, movie format, uh, CD, uh, audio format, and so on, so that our, and, and it penetrates our culture so people can be informed. Because by and large, with regards to these theological issues, the masses are truly uninformed. Uh, uh, and many might even be misinformed. They might even believe things that may not be true uh, about Christ and his church. That's why... Uh, there's a need for a continuing reformation and the title of my book the reformation cannot be over uh, now andrew mcgowan uh, reinforces the need uh, for the continuation of the reformation which started five centuries ago 
uh, for the following six reasons, uh, and which are cited uh, also in my book, and uh, of uh, the Reformation cannot be over. Andrew McGowan's book was always reforming, and he cited that God speaks today. Uh, theologians make mistakes. New issues require new thinking. Scriptures must have priority over confessions, the right of private judgment, and above all, it is important that we engage in the process of semper reformanda, always reforming in the proper spirit and manner. Uh, Martin, Dr. Martin Luther was more than a mad monk, a composer of 95 Theses. He was an enlightened liberator, this is why I tell his story in my book, The Reformation Cannot Be Over. Luther, one of the most significant figures in Christian history, profoundly shaped the character of Western civilization and many of the structures of our modern world bear his stamp. What compelled this man to take his stand and loom so large in modern history? Uh, it was the flaming truth he saw. Christianity is no mere creed or confession. It is ultimate reality in Jesus Christ. The scriptures are God's authoritative word, the revelation of truth. Convinced of this, Dr. Luther had no choice but to stand for truth even if it meant taking on the power structure of his day. It was the very nature of his radical discovery within the scriptures, for as he sat in the flickering candlelight, pouring over the scriptures, Luther discovered that the central theme of all scripture was the justice of God. When Isaiah admonished the Jews to do justice, and Amos thundered, let justice roll down like living waters. The Hebrew word they used was sedek, literally meant righteousness. It was God's declaration that men and women and social structures must be in conformity with the standards of a just and holy God. Uh, the, the New Testament sets forth the same standard but it is embodied in Jesus Christ, who pays for our sins, bearing God's judgment in his own body. Thus, the Apostle Paul could write, we are justified, declared righteous by our faith in Christ alone. The biblical theme is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. The justice anticipated in the Old Testament called forth by the law and prophets is fulfilled in the New Testament through Christ the Mediator. No dichotomy then between justice and faith. So, in that great moment when the gates of heaven swung open for him, Dr. Luther saw a whole biblical vision. God demands justice, that is, righteousness in all of the created order, and he declares men and women righteous by their faith alone in Jesus Christ. The Christian then must see all of the word world. The Christian must then see all the world through God's eyes or the lens of the Most High and Holy One. Uh, righteous from the for the righteousness for the world. Uh, for the righteousness for the structures of society and righteousness for the people. This leads to the biblical worldview which affects all of life. The task of people of God is as far as possible in a sinful society to reclaim the cosmos for God's uh, created purpose. In other words, the Creator must have had some purpose in creating this paradise that we're in. And the second paradise up there where the International Space Station is and Mars and uh, Europa and Saturn and uh, the Milky Way galaxy and millions of other, uh, according to the Hubble uh, Space Telescope, uh, there's millions of other galaxies up there in this universe. And he had a reason for creating this particular 
paradise here, the first paradise, uh, biblically thinking. And the second paradise is up there and where the International Space Station is at and Mars and so on, and the sun. And uh, then the third paradise is uh, planet heaven, which is beyond this universe. And you can't get there in a space vehicle. You're, it's The only way you can get there is through the cross of Christ. And in the Bible, Jesus allowed uh, the beloved disciple John to go there and see that place. And uh, he allowed Paul to go there. And in the Quran, uh, Prophet Muhammad was allowed to go there. And what they saw was the throne of the majestic. Uh, and uh, that's in the book of Revelation for you to read. And the one of Prophet Muhammad is in the Quran. Our own age needs that same holistic view. In recent decades, many Christian endeavors have divided into two camps, social activists in one and soul winners in the other. Those seeking to right injustices and meet human needs have been accused of abandoning the classic Christian call to evangelize the lost. Meanwhile, the social activists deride soul winners for being concerned only with altar calls and notches in their Bible belts. Uh, the connection is clear in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, where the Greek word of justification, uh, dikai sunai, uh, is the term used uh, to translate the various cognates of Sedek, the Hebrew term for justice. People further the confusion by defining justice in secular terms, uh, everyone getting his or her due, then politi politi poli polit politicizing that interpretation, depending on their uh, partisan uh, learnings or their partisan leanings. Uh, conservatives often suppose that justice means punishing wrongdoers, while liberals assert that it means everyone getting their fair share of society's benefits. Uh, both are embraced within, but fall short of the full biblical meaning. How desperately the modern church needs to recapture the full biblical uh, vision of justice. And we need also to take hold of Luther's great contribution to the church, the unity of biblical truth, and its relevance to all of life in an integrated Christian world. Uh, sadly, has Francis Schaeffer, a renowned 20th century theologian, pointed out in his book, How Shall We Then Live? The Rise and Decline of Western Thought and Culture, that the church at large did little to actually guide the tide of increased wealth during the Industrial Revolution. While there were individual attempts to do so, for the most part, the church ignored biblical principles regarding the use of wealth. This lack of Christian compassion was partially responsible for the abuses of the day, the slums in industrial towns, the exploitation of children, and women in particular, uh, the uh, racial segregation uh, of the 20th century in um, America, the vast gulf between the wealth of a few and the misery of many, and the growth of the slave trade, of which many churches were silent. Some churches spoke up against these injustices, but by and large, most of them were silent. Uh, in raising, crying out against the injustice of these different maladies uh, of our uh, of our of our culture, uh, reform-minded Christians eventually woke up and addressed these abuses. Martin Luther cast his eyes over the the landscape of his day and saw that it was all the Lord's, from the farmer tilling the soil to the prince hearing the pleas of his people, to the merchant selling his wares, to the child singing a small song, 
all of it was a, re, a reflect of righteousness, justice, uh, righteous justice of the Lord of heaven and earth. All of it was to reflect right relations between people and their Lord and right relations between people and their neighbors. All of it was to proclaim the glory of God. Luther's vision uh, for biblical justice shaped not only his own perspectives and actions, but launched a movement that swept across Europe, its currents surging with new leaders, John Calvin, uh, Ulrich Zingley, uh, Philip Melanchthon, John Knox. Soon the entire continent of Europe was in the midst of a mighty and far-reaching reformation. Seized by this biblically informed view of life and the realization that Scripture made truth plainly known to men and women, these reformers were moved by a high uh, and holy passion filled with the fear of God, the deepest reverence for the Lord Almighty. Their cries became quorum Dio, that means in the presence of God, and nothing could stop them. Has Dr. Luther sought to reclaim the faith from the cultural corruption of his church and unconsciously began to embrace over the centuries his work was less a radical new beginning than it was a reformation in the truest sense of the term uh, to uh, return to the essence of what the church had been in its noble past. The reformation uh, was more than a cleansing of ecclesiastical structures. Nothing was left untouched. The arts, commerce, government, and education all came uh, under its powerful influence. State and church had been wed in an unholy alliance uh, since Constantine, each using the other for its own purposes. Uh, with the gospel held hostage, the church could bring little reforming influence on culture. The reformers seeing God, his sovereign, and the church has the people of God uh, wrenched from went, wrenched free from the emperor's clutches and enabled the church to make a profound difference in societal values and structures. The reformers changed the view of man in relation to the state. Luther's view uh, and belief in the priesthood of all believers that men and women had direct access to God and need not go through any earthly mediator provided the philosophical foundation for political change also. All men and women, whether sovereign or uh, peasant, were equal in God's eyes. Uh, all were created in the image of God and imbued with intrinsic dignity, and all were fallen and in need of divine grace. Since the rights of individual came from God, the state power could no longer be regarded as absolute, nor could a ruler's divine authority be a charter for arbitrary rule. One who expounded such radical ideas with particular cogency was the Scottish minister Samuel Rutherford, disciple of John Knox's ministry. Rutherford wrote the classic work Lex Rex, The Law is King, in 1644, arguing that the truth of Christ could never be subordinate to Caesar. Only Christ's authority is absolute and arbitrary. God is the true seat of government. Rulers are merely trustees and stewards of God-given authority. The sovereign must administer law, not break, abrogate, or dispense with it. Public magistrates are public servants. Even the king, highest authority in the land, is a servant. Lex Rex laid the philosophical foundation for a constitutional republic and formed the best balances man's intrinsic dignity with his inherent sinful nature that demands restraint. Uh, there are principles uh, where soon uh, these principles were soon transported across the Atlantic, uh, and John Witherspoon, president of uh, what would become Princeton University, 
and the only clergyman to sign the Declaration of Independence, advanced Rutherford's ideas in America's great constitutional debates. Thomas Jefferson also drew on Rutherford's indirectly when he borrowed from John Locke's uh, Locke, one of the Enlightenment's great thinker, had himself been influenced by Lex Rex, secularizing Rutherford's concepts into a, his view of a social contract, inalienable rights, separation of power, consent of the governed, and the right of revolution. Uh, though not a Christian, uh, John Locke, he composed his own Bible, uh, and uh, like Thomas Jefferson with scissors, cut some portions out that uh, they had trouble believing. Uh, uh, it's hard for the natural-minded man uh, uh, to actually believe all, believe all that Christ began to do and teach, if you remember, in the introduction of uh, the book I read to you. Uh, not only was it hard for them to hear and digest and get their minds to wrap around it and accept, but they were trying to stamp it out. They didn't want it part of their empire. So Christianity and Christ building his church has come through uh, an awfully mighty long way through a lot of obstacles and difficulties, persecutions and difficulties, but he still is building his church and his church will prevail. He said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, ne uh, nevertheless, uh, these Christian-based ideas became uh, pretty much part of the New World debate, even though there was a lot to try to hinder that and to stop its truths from reaching the masses of people. That's why I said there's a great revival now outpacing the spread of Islam in the global south Africa and South America and Latin America right now because of translations of this word. It's getting out uh, amongst the masses of people now with you know people with the, everybody having their own phone. It's right there for them now. And once they hear this, masses are accepting Christ. Uh, they love the Lord. Uh, the great revival is taking place right now, more so in the global south than anywhere else in the world. And we can't forget what's going on in China too. Uh, so uh, masses are starting to hear and remember faith cometh by hearing uh, so uh, we are to pray the more for this great outpour of God's spirit and the salvation of souls uh, so two streams one from the Scottish reformers and the other from enlightenment thinkers do from the common reservoir of the reformation and converged in America with the first truly constitutional republic also, uh, the forces unleashed in the Reformation were producing massive political and social reforms in England. The Reformation's biblical worldview and the vision of justice drove John Wesley, William Wilberforce, and Lord Shaftesbury, and Elizabeth Fry, and thousands of others in their crusade for the uh, abolition of the slave trade and uh, the reform of values and the prevention of exploitation of children and workers in the mines and prisons. So Drop that baby. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs>